Well, it's, it is uh, a great honour to be here to, to show you some of this material. I do want to start by thanking both Paul and our director, uh, Dr Sturgis, for their support in this very small initiative to uh, continue, as it were, our understanding of what's going on in the Middle East and, and what we're losing as a result of the current political situation. Um, they didn't hesitate to uh, allow me to put together that tiny little installation that I hope many of you will have seen uh, opposite the information desk on the ground floor, just highlighting that, that notion of what loss means, particularly in a museum setting. And so on that basis, I also want to thank very much indeed um, uh, Graham in the design department, Graham Campbell, the head of design, who helped me put that together, and to get you all here uh, this afternoon, um, Jude Barrett in education, without whom uh, this certainly wouldn't have happened either. So to, to my colleagues in the museum, thank you very much indeed. Well, what the world is losing in Iraq is immense, sadly. Um, we were, of course, over the end of February, early weeks of March, faced by a whole plethora of headlines in the newspapers highlighting the damage that was going on. And it was unclear at the time what those reports actually meant on the ground. And indeed, it continues to be very unclear. What we do have a sense of, however, is a series of attacks on some of the great cultural institutions and monuments of northern Iraq um, by Islamic State, ISIS, ISIL, um, Daesh, whatever you want to call them. Uh, beginning at the end of February, we saw the Mosul Library ransacked. Um, and then at the beginning, um, at the very end of that month, um, that uh, sort of infamous video emerged on YouTube, social media, um, from the Islamic State showing the ransacking of the Mosul Museum and attacks on the city of Nineveh. Um, and then reports started to follow. Um, the attack on Nimrud, bulldozed, we were told. Hatra, ex uh, demolished, exploded, bulldozed. And then finally, on the 8th of March, uh, the Iraqi Minister of Tourism and Antiquities um, made it clear uh, that along with ongoing destruction at the site of Khorsabad, um, that indeed Nimrud and Hatra had been bulldozed. We don't yet know the extent of that damage. There have been no further videos, there have been no photographs. Attempts to look at these sites through satellite images have been unsuccessful in defining the level of damage. But I think the fact that the Iraqi government are saying that at least something has happened highlights the world that um, we are uh, losing at least uh, something very important, if not everything. This, of course, is part of a wider picture of destruction. Um, as Paul mentioned, um, I was helping, again with Jude, last year to highlight the ongoing destruction in Syria, the great cultural tragedy that's going on there, as well as, of course, the great humanitarian crisis. Uh, but it's much deeper than that. Top of the slide here, you can see this wonderful panorama of the Bamiyan Valley. In 2001, you will remember those great Buddhas, um, now uh, apparent only by their, the, as were the shadow of their former presence in the niches, those great Buddha sculptures were destroyed by the Taliban. So uh, uh, an ideology of destruction was already in place. And of course, there are other forms of destruction which have, uh, in a sense, ransacked uh, Iraq over the last several decades. In 2003, with the, um, the invasion of the country, um, we saw the looting and ransacking of the Iraq Museum. And so I've put in there, at the bottom left-hand corner, one of the great iconic images, um, one of the great iconic objects from the Iraq Museum, looted in April as the invasion happened and has never resurfaced, almost certainly uh, destroyed. It's an ivory uh, highly vulnerable piece, one of the great masterpieces of antiquity. And there on the right-hand side of the slide at the bottom, you see uh, a sculptured head, one of 60 objects recovered from the, uh, that had clearly been looted from Iraq and that emerged on the market on March the 16th this year. This highlights how looting and uh, the sale, of, or the attempted sale of these objects overseas is part of the problem. 
Well, what do we know that's been lost recently in Iraq in those last uh, couple of months? Well, I want to place them in some sort of historical context and show you at least what was there before the bull bulldozers moved in. Again, just to emphasize um, the great loss we have in terms of archaeology and art, but also the ongoing problem. And the story I start with is with those great cities that were listed on that earlier slide. In the north of modern-day Iraq, in ancient Mesopotamia, as we heard, are the uh, centers of Assyrian civilization. Let me get this to work. Doesn't matter, I'll point to it. Um, you can see a fear Assyria marked on the river Tigris, in northern Iraq, we have running north to south the great cities of Khorsabad, Nineveh, and Nimrud. These were the great capital cities of an empire that established its control across the entire Middle East between around 900 and 600 BC. It was the largest empire the world had seen to that date. And the glories of that empire, which stretched from Egypt in the west to Iran in the east, were few focused in on these great projects, building projects. Uh, we'll begin with Nimrud, established in the 9th century BC by this king, Ashurnazipal II, an image of him here um, standing on a pedestal, this object now in the British Museum, and we get a sense of the glories of the building he was creating at Nimrud from his own inscriptions. Here, I have just uh, a highlight of what's known as the standard inscription. You can see a version of it in one of the fragments we have on display in the Near East Gallery upstairs. And there in the middle, you'll see that he invited 69,574 people to a party to celebrate the inauguration of this palace. Such was its splendor, such was the extent of his control. This was something he wanted to show off. It was one of the wonders of the world, and he was keen for thousands of people to see it. This is a view, uh, an aerial view, of the great citadel mound of Nimrud, taken in the 1970s. Looking <coughs> across to the river Tigris, winding its way north towards uh, Mosul. There in the bottom half of the slide, you can see the great ancient citadel mound, the remains of millennia of building in mud brick. So Nimrud is a very, very ancient site, stretching back at least into the 6th millennia BC. And it was on the summit of that mound that Ashurnazipal constructed his great wondrous palace. Close up of the citadel mound shows uh, the site riddled with the, uh, the trenches and remains of excavation. Excavation that has been going on there since the middle of the 19th century and the remains of a great open-air museum. From the ground, Nimrud is just as impressive. Looking across in the spring, Nimrud is, is, a, is a wonderful sight amongst all the spring flowers and the fertile lands of northern Iraq. And you can see in the centre of the slide there uh, the remains of the enormous ziggurat tower, a solid, stepped platform, uh, a religious centre within the heart of uh, Nimrud. Nimrud, as I said, was excavated in the 19th century initially, and uh, the, the great palace of Ashurnazipal was revealed, and some of the enormous slabs of carved gypsum that lined the walls of the most important courtyards and, and uh, rooms in the palace were removed and taken to European museums, like the British Museum, like the Ashmolean, indeed museums around the world. But many more were left behind. This is a plan of the so-called Northwest plan Palace, as archaeologists call it, the palace of this great Assyrian king. And you can see it consists of a huge number of rooms separated by vast courtyards. These were areas for reception, uh, for greeting diplomats, for embassies, and so on. The throne room sits at the very centre of this complex of rooms. 
That building was re-excavated during the 1950s and 60s in an excavation sponsored by the British School of Archaeology in Iraq. The image you see at the top of the slide here shows that those excavations in progress, the ziggurat tower in the background. Uh, there on the left-hand side of the slide, you might just be able to make out uh, quite a, a large lady. That's Agatha Christie, the wife of Max Mallowan, who was directing uh, the excavations on behalf of the British School. And those excavations uh, were resumed uh, by our Iraqi colleagues during the 1970s and 80s, uh, the image you can see in the bottom of the slide, where they not only revealed new areas of the palace that had previously laid uh, uncovered, but they um, refurbished the palace erecting monuments that had fallen, the great slabs of stone were put back into place, the great guardian figures at the gateways set up and cleaned. They were creating, in a sense, an open-air museum for people, for the people of Iraq and for tourists. And in that process of, of revealing more of the great Northwest Palace, they discovered the tombs of the queens of Assyria, one of the most remarkable finds, uh, really, in terms of archaeological history, but little known, because immediately in the years following its discovery, 1989, 1990, the first Gulf War broke out, and these objects were uh, taken to safety in the National Bank in Baghdad, where they remain to this day. Uh, an extraordinary find of, of jewellery um, which rivals anything um, produced in the ancient world, yet to be a feature of any museum display. But what of the Northwest Palace itself? What of that building that the Iraqis, in a sense, were, were putting back together for people to visit? Well, we know that it was, as I've said here, a magical place. These were not buildings simply for the glory of the king. They were special places where the rituals of state could take place. So here in this reconstruction of the throne room at Nimrud by its 19th century excavator, you see the wall paintings and the great stone reliefs, which were painted originally, um, decorating the walls to create a magical space in which the king could be blessed by the gods and perform the rituals of state to maintain the state. So all the images had magical properties. They were functional as indeed most ancient art was. It wasn't there just to be beautiful. It actually worked. It's a magical place to the extent that I can put back into place the relief you can see in the gallery here in the, the lower ground floor, just outside these doors. One single relief which was part of a complex whole, this guarding an important uh, gateway into the throne room itself. Each room at Nimrud was lined with these images of the king being blessed by his servants, being blessed by the gods, creating these magical working spaces. Powerful. And that's what you could do by going to Nimrud. You could see the palace itself. You could walk around it and see the reliefs in situ, an experience that you can't get in a museum. This is a view of the open air museum, the Northwest Palace, on the Citadel Mound at Nimrud, uh, taken a couple of decades ago. This is what it would have looked like before uh, the recent bulldozing. What you can see in the foreground is the courtyard that uh, allows you to walk up to the great facade which gave entrance into the imperial throne room. And on that facade, um, there was some incredible decoration. Enormous, this is one of the three gateways that led into the throne room, enormous sculpted winged bulls, human-headed, wearing headdresses of bull's horns, showing that they were divinities. On a colossal scale, this is, as I say, one of three gateways. At the actual gateway itself are smaller, protective figures. If we look more closely at those, they are extraordinary objects which you won't find in museums. The British Museum has nothing like this, for example, um, where these human-headed winged lions, the lions, the great symbol of Assyrian kings, uh, actually have 
human arms which clasp before them in a welcoming gesture. At the other surviving gateway, a similar setup, in which case the gate is protected at all angles by these supernatural figures. And in this particular one, you can see that our, our two smaller guardian figures actually have cradled in one, under one arm the remains of a little deer. These are extraordinary images representing fertility and abundance and the procreation magically created by the gods for the king. Inside the throne room itself were the remains of some of the great decorative scheme. Yes, there are some in the British Museum, but the vast majority sit here at Nimrud. Walls lined with huge slabs showing not just the king and the gods in attention to each other, but scenes of narrative history, some of the earliest that survive in the world, showing the king's ritual hunting uh, uh, war. Further into the palace still, and we have rooms completely surrounded by supernatural spirits, creating those magical zones in which the rituals could take place. Again, these are images of reliefs in situ at Nimrud. And what's remarkable about these reliefs, unlike the ones you will see in museums around the world, are that they retain evidence of the original paint. Many of the reliefs, for example, that came out in the 19th century were cleaned to make them more attractive to 19th century viewers. What you see here at Nimrud is something of their original colour. The beards, the hair, the sandals, the clothing, picked out in colours. Fragments, but nonetheless unique in terms of understanding the importance of this art. Further into the palace still, another great open courtyard with another series of guardian figures, uh, winged uh, bulls in this particular case, which lead deeper into the palace and at its very heart, in this case a covered area, um, showing some of the best surviving reliefs and repeating that imagery of the importance of the king's relationship with his gods and the fact that the king is bringing order to chaos through the rituals that he's undertaking in these special places. So enormous amount of material lying at Nimrud. This uh, material, these stone reliefs, are made of a very soft gypsum. Uh, a bulldozer running into these would almost certainly shatter them. Um, we can imagine uh, an enormous loss has taken place. Here, uh, a screenshot from the Islamic State video. Um, most of the image was, we saw um, of the objects being destroyed in that video date much later than Nimrud. But this one image, as the camera panned through the galleries, reveals a gallery devoted to ancient Assyria, including some of these winged lions. Here, you're just seeing the plastic sheeting that had been covering it for protection being removed. We presume in advance of its destruction. Nimrud, established by the Assyrian king Ashurnasirpal II in the 9th century BC, by the end of the 8th century BC, the capital was moved uh, up the river to the site of Khorsabad by the Assyrian king Sargon II, and he built a city from scratch. On a grand scale, because he now ruled an empire stretching from the Mediterranean world to the mountains of Iran. Here is a reconstruction of Khorsabad, as constructed by uh, Sargon. And some of the monuments revealed at this city. Uh, in the top, you see the, remain, the result of excavations by the University of Chicago. Uh, in the 1920s and 30s, and in the lower part of the slide, some of those reliefs in place in the Oriental Institute Museum in Chicago. Most of the great monuments at Khorsabad were removed by the excavators, either to Baghdad, to the Louvre, since the French excavated the site in the 19th century, or to Chicago, and the rest were reburied. Khorsabad today is not the sort of open-air museum 
that uh, Nimrud was. Uh, but nonetheless, and it's an extraordinarily interesting site because there are objects still in situ and the layout of the impressive buildings uh, are clearly demarcated by modern mud brick walls. But remember, many of the monuments were buried, reburied by the archaeologists. And again, we can only imagine what bulldozing this site might have revealed and has now been broken up for the antiquities market. The final great city, and perhaps its greatest in the Assyrian Empire, was that of Nineveh. Uh, Sargon's capital lasted only as long as the king himself and his, his successor, Sennacherib, moved the capital to this very ancient site of Nineveh. So back, uh, north, uh, back south down the River Tigris to a city that again dates back to at least the 6th millennia BC. And here is Nineveh, now surrounded by the suburbs of modern-day Mosul. Mosul, uh, originally uh, a, a city which emerged as an important Islamic centre in the 8th century AD. Uh, uh, you can see marked on this Google map image with the dot there on the uh, left-hand side of the river Tigris. Across the river from the old Islamic centre of Mosul lay ancient Nineveh. And to help you see it, here it is. An enormous city, massive walls surrounding a huge urban complex and two citadel mound areas on which palaces and temples have been constructed by the Assyrian kings. One called Koyunjik, the largest one, the other Nebuyunus to the south. Now, as they surrounded very much by the suburbs of Mosul. It is the walls of Mosul that are among its most impressive remains. Um, restored, certainly, by the Iraqi Antiquities Department during the 70s and 80s, but nonetheless, vast amounts of it still surviving, encircling that vast area. And the gateways that led into this great city also identified some 15 in total, perhaps 18, there's some debate, but 15 certainly named and identified by the ancient sources and by archaeological work. And the most famous of those gates is the so-called Nergal Gate. If we look closely at the Nergal Gate, we can see that it's guarded, just like the gateways at Nimrud, by colossal human-headed winged bulls. These are some of the largest and finest in terms of sculpturing. Uh, the face of the bull, you can see there on the right hand of the slide, one of the most wonderful images, I think, from Iraq, this, this beautiful, serene, passive image of a most powerful, supernatural, protective figure. That is the face we see being erased by Islamic State. If you look in the top of the slide, you can see through the gateway behind that wonderful uh, winged figure another set of uh, protective figures. This is a double gate. One, the front guarded by enormous sculptures, then smaller figures behind. So you get a sense of perspective as you look through the gate, as it leads your eye towards the great buildings beyond. Here, the inner gateway, less well preserved, but now reduced to nothing. So that great monument of the gates of Nineveh, now certainly gone. The video demonstrates that. If we move rapidly forward in time, however, we're reminded of Iraq's immense history and its immense contribution to civilization. Um, if you look at this map, you can see Mosul on the River Tigris marked in red. <coughs> And some 68 miles to the southwest lies the archaeological remains of Hatra. Hatra flourished in the early centuries AD, perhaps established in the 3rd century BC, but really has its heyday uh, in the centuries, 1st uh, and 2nd centuries, when it was part of an extensive international network which linked Hatra with Palmyra in the Syrian desert, and then across 
to the Mediterranean through places like Baalbek, crossing the Lebanese mountains, or south down the Royal Road to Petra. And Petra, Palmyra, and Hatra all share the same common tradition. They are local native dynasties flourishing as a result of these trade routes in relationships with imperial Rome. Aerial view of Hatra, and we see this great city surrounded by concentric walls, very typical of uh, these sort of desert cities, and also very typical of cities of antiquity in the ancient Near East, is that the vast area at the centre of these settlements was occupied by the religious buildings. And you can see here both in the plan, and I hope in the, uh, the aerial photograph, the great uh, rectangle which contained the remains of the temples at Hatra. And here, an aerial view of Hatra itself. If any of you have been to Palmyra, have been to Baalbek or to, to Petra, you'll know that the great uh, religious buildings uh, have an enormous temenos, uh, an open area for the faithful to gather in front of what is an essentially the God's house. And then the priests, in a sense, could enter the God's house, which is at the back of the temenos. And so you see here Hatra, an exact parallel with that tradition. On an enormous scale, it's an immensely wealthy city of its day. Up close, the buildings are equally impressive. On a monumental scale, a series of God's houses, um, these great arched entranceways into these solid stone structures. This is what we're told has been demolished by Islamic State. Um, explosions were heard. Um, we can only fear uh, the worst. And the sculpture that was associated with these buildings excavated during the 70s and 80s was equally remarkable. As remarkable as the funerary sculpture of Palmyra or indeed um, the sculpture of Petra. Uh, what we see are a combination of Parthian, Roman and local traditions being fused together in what is the centre of one of the earliest Arab kingdoms. This, in a sense, is, is Arab art. Most of those sculptures were removed from the site of Hatra itself and taken to museums and replaced by casts. Um, and, but nonetheless, there were surviving sculpture at the site, and in the right-hand side of the slide at the top, you can see images of faces and of camels, of course the main beast of burden by this time uh, on the trade routes, carved into the architecture itself. Many of these sculptures were taken to the museum in Mosul. And early reports when the video first emerged of the destruction at the site suggested that what we were looking at was the destruction of uh, of castes. We now know that was not the case. There were about 50 sculptures, genuine, authentic sculptures, in the Mosul Museum, both from Hatra and from sites in Assyria, Nimrud and Nineveh. Only about six were casts. So the sort of image you see in the bottom of the slide here, one of the sculptures, one of the original sculptures from Hatra, was in the Mosul Museum and this is what we saw being destroyed. There is no doubt that this was real, as Paul called it, stuff. Let's go back to Mosul, back to Nineveh, and remind you that, of course, we're not just dealing with ancient monuments. We're dealing with the monuments that are part of the living communities of Iraq of Mosul particularly. Um, if we look at Nebi Yunus, that ancient mound which supported uh, uh, Assyrian palaces and temples, um, we're reminded that there on the top of that mound was built uh, a mosque dedicated to the prophet Jonah. Traditionally, his burial place, uh, Nebi Yunus, the, the, the prophet Jonah. 
And that mosque had been built over a much earlier Nestorian church because, of course, Iraq was one of the earliest places where we find Christianity spreading in the early centuries AD. So a sequence of buildings on Nebi Yunus. In July of last year, the mosque of Jonah was erased through explosions. So we're losing not just landmarks, but the very places where faith is sustained, where people worship. And it's worth remembering that next door to that mosque during the 1980s um, was revealed an even more ancient Assyrian palace. Uh, little had been known about this site because of the sacred nature of, of the mosque, but permission was granted for some exploratory explorations in the 80s, uh, and this is what was revealed. Another enormous palace guarded by uh, colossal winged human-headed bulls, dating to the reign of the Assyrian king Esarhaddon. No doubt this material was reburied, but we don't know whether it's been damaged or indeed refound and being broken up as we speak. Other sites throughout Mosul have suffered. Um, the Mosque of Jerid's 12th century, the Mashhad Qasem of the 13th century. These are great architectural pieces. They date to the golden age of Islamic art and architecture and intellectual thinking when, of course, Islam was the centre of, uh, of forward thinking, of, of advanced science, um, covered with mosaics, uh, inlaid with uh, 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 glazed bricks. Uh, these were remarkable monuments in art history, as well as, of course, places of pilgrimage and faith. They now have disappeared. Churches in Mosul have also been under attack, Remember, Christianity, uh, very anciently rooted in Iraq. Um, there's been reports of churches having been demolished, but little evidence has emerged to verify that, except for a few pictures such as these, which show uh, crosses being replaced by the Islamic State flag, and then images of the Virgin and Child um, being uh, erased. Perhaps the most disturbing in many ways because it, it impacts immediately on the people of Mosul itself is the destruction of the libraries. Um, the monuments and museums have been attacked, but as early as February the 3rd, we were hearing through UNESCO the destruction of um, libraries across the city. And the Mosul Central Library was, contains some of the most important manuscript from Iraq's past, dating back to the 18th century, the records in effect of the ancient families of Mosul, um, which could be traced back, the lineages, through this written documentation, now seems to have been completely destroyed. It is that living community, that living presence, in a sense, that is made real through both libraries and then the monuments in museums or um, on the ground. And here is a quote from uh, Professor Zena Parani, made in 2003 following the devastations wrought on the cultural heritage of Iraq at that time, but it's still regrettably relevant. Yet we should not forget that cultural heritage and monuments, despite their significance to the world, are a powerful basis of local histories and identities. Historical artefacts, works of art, and monuments are the agents of memory and even a sense of self. Their loss is psychologically devastating well beyond the loss that is calculated at the market value of antiquities. That is the power of museums and also the power of monuments. They give a sense of identity, they give a sense of cohesion. The people of Mosul um, used to picnic at Nimrud and at Nineveh. These were monuments that were very much part of their shared identity, their sense of place. 
Today, all we can do, alas, is, in a sense, uh, voice our sense of commitment and unity with their struggle. We hope a time will come when we'll be able to do more than just simply put notices in an empty display case. Um, and we hope, of course, at the same time, that there will be something left for the communities of Iraq to share. Thank you very much.